to the next of our post-coronavirus um, uh, skeleton keys to contemporary sociological theory. Today, we're going to work our way through Butler's uh, gender trouble, Judith Butler's gender trouble. Um, I'll be making the claim later, um, maybe even in the second half of, uh, of this video, part two of the video, um, that um, a skeleton key to Butler's gender trouble is located in, in structural uh, psychoanal psychoanalytic social theory, uh, particularly Lacan. Um, uh, we're going to talk about Levi Strauss, Lacan, Freud, even. And, and again, I think it's more important for us to sort of get through chapter one of her book first before we, we sort of provide a little bit of the background material that helps you unlock uh, uh, the rest of the book. So it, it's, we're, we're going to use Foucault a little bit uh, first, sort of a post-structuralist, uh, um, late 20th century post-structural uh, theorist uh, as we're walking our way through chapter one. But again, we'll sort of forestall a discussion of Lacan, Levi-Strauss, and Freud until, until uh, part two of the video. Okay, so um, Gender Trouble's very uh, interesting book. Um, it's, it's a book that, that um, it, it's very impressive. She was quite young when she wrote the book. Um, it, it is remarkable in the clarity and the quality of the comprehension of, uh, of just a, a very wide literature. And the argument is very condensed and, and, uh, and very well, um, uh, well presented. So the basic claim here is that, uh, you know, we're living in late capitalism and, and uh, uh, the, you know, Marx's name comes up. It's really not framed in terms of Marx, but Marx is there. So we're living in late capitalism. That there are matrices of domination or matrices of power uh, that pre generate some uh, discourses, uh, law-like systems of rules, um, uh, systems of, of discipline, systems of punishment to follow Foucault's uh, terminology. There's linguistic structures uh, that constrain us in all kinds of ways. And, that, and that, that the complexity of the structural determinations of social life, right, provides something like openings or opportunities for us to intervene and to generate progressive social change. So uh, the, the title Gender Trouble refers to both the sort of the trouble uh, with conceptualizations of gender, both, out, both in sort of everyday culture and, and within um, uh, feminist, feminism. And, you know, problematic notions of, of, of what is the essential uh, nature of woman um, um, and so on. But it also refers to the idea that, um, that actors in, um, in complex systems, like late capital, um, can trouble the system. That by engaging in subversive activity, subversive uh, personal activity, group activity, organized activity, various kinds, that you can actually disrupt the system and help pro produce uh, progressive social change. And so, uh, so I really like her, her arguments here. It's very much um, a, a structural and post-structuralist framing of the problem of gender. And uh, again, a very uh, coherent uh, argument about the possibilities uh, for the future. So, okay, so gender trouble. Um, uh, let's begin then by um, walking our way through um, just a very quick argument about the method, the er method of critical social theory. So I mentioned this already, that critical social theory um, defetishizes social objects. Our goal is to comprehend the content of society as a product or an effect of social structure. Uh, we try to reveal that the sources of, of the power that appears to emanate from moral objects comes from, uh, from us, right? So Marx analyzed commodities, money, capital. Uh, these are things that seem to radiate with fetish power, right? They seem to be possessed by some sort of power of both fascination and domination that comes out of them. And, and of course, he analyzes them as a result of, of uh, as being nothing more than, than dead labor alienated uh, uh, from workers and projected onto, uh, onto these bearers of, um, of value, right? So we defetishized uh, these objects. Durkheim defetishized gods, demons, uh, totems, uh, and saw that these, um, I mean, his argument was, again, not your God. Your God's the real God. But the gods that he analyzed uh, were gods that were um, resulting from a ritualized activity, projections really of the power of society itself, alienated from uh, from the society and projected onto um, 
some bearer of that power, right? So uh, gods, again, not your god, but the gods that Durkheim analyzed uh, were, were, again, were alienated uh, uh, and projected um, social powers, defetishized them. Weber defetishized charismatic authority. David Smith uh, wrote uh, much of his work is, is on this, right? Um, so the charismatic leader uh, appears to be someone who vibrates with an internal uh, power of their own, right? And, and uh, again, the Weber argued that the charismatic leader is really uh, a receptor of the alienated and projected uh, recognition by, uh, by groups of people who are um, extra legal, um, extra traditional, that they're in sort of an unusual situation and are full of sort of, uh, of mana-like energy that winds up projected onto uh, the charismatic authority leader. But it really, and again, alienated, projected uh, social power. Butler now is looking at gender and sex, okay? As things that seem to have a natural, um, um, unproblematic uh, quality about them, especially sex. Sex seems to be a, a resultant of, of nature. Um, and her argument is going to be that gender and sex are products or the effects of, of juridical, uh, uh, law-like uh, practices, discursive practices, uh, prohibitions, and so on. So she's going to be arguing and examining the way in which gender and sex are, are generated uh, by... Um, um, are an effect, really, of, of discourses, of linguistic uh, uh, power, and, and uh, practices of, um, of, again, law-like uh, structures. So, again, so she's defetishizing gender and sex, and then by doing so, by understanding the social foundation of these categories, uh, she's going to be arguing that, that these categories can be disrupted, can be changed, can be comprehended, and that the complexity of them can be understood enough that we would be able to intervene in them, again, in, in, to turn society in a progressive direction. Okay, so uh, so like Marx and uh, like most critical social theorists, Butler uh, isn't engaged merely in a in a study of social objects, but she's engaged in a political project. Um, so she mentioned that there's a political project of social theory, um, trying to comprehend the contemporary field of power, the historical present. is on page seven uh, to locate opportunities at this juncture of history. Really, this juncture of cultural politics. This arrangement of the matrix matrices of uh, of power to find opportunities to critique the categories of identity that are produced by that matrix of power and then to develop a feminist uh, political practice that allows one to rethink and reformulate gender identities, uh, sex as a category, and then the feminist politics that results from it. So again, progressive social change is something that can result from effective theorizing of structures of, of, of domination. Okay, so again, we're gonna we'll, we'll talk much more in detail in the next uh, uh, video. But Butler's the skeleton key to the book then is Butler's usage and reformulation of structural psychoanalysis, especially Lacan, Freud, Levi Strauss, um, and then the use of of Foucault's really post structuralist discursive uh, productive theory of power. Right. So again, what she's doing is inverting the normal way that that we think about power in the same way that Foucault did. Um, where power isn't something that regulates and controls people as much as it generates the subjects, generates the categories, generates the, the identities that then that the system of power attempts to, to control. So in, in the history of sexuality, the entire book is really, again, this is a very, very crude drawing, but, but the argument that, that Foucault makes in the history of sexuality, volume one, is that Whatever the embodied pleasures of uh, that we think of now under the category of sex, whatever those practices were, um, they weren't. Uh, they become um, subject to regulatory, juridical, uh, legal, uh, punitive, and disciplinary um, uh, authority. Um, through the uh, sort of elaboration of of something like you know of of um, of discourses of power, of power 
uh, knowledge discourses uh, emanating from, say, psychiatry, uh, medical science, uh, sociology and criminology, uh, theology and religious practices, you know, the pastoral care that, that he writes about in the book, um, legal and juridical uh, uh, processes and categories, and that these different structures of thought with unifying logics, with categories, with uh, conceptual schemas, and so on, and with practices that are embedded within institutions that have that have agents that have uh, policing and so on um, that have the power then to sort of grab hold of subjects uh, through the category that gets constructed called sexuality. And so you know he, he begins the book. I won't go into the detail of some of some of this, but he you know he has an account in the book of of, um, of something like rural farm. Um, um, sexual practices uh, that today would clearly be seen as perverse, illegal, uh, highly problematic, uh, but that but that probably had existed from time out of mind until, um, and, and people had probably practiced uh, these behaviors from time out of mind until uh, you know the 19th century when a particular um, uh, juridico legal. Uh, uh, system was able to sort of grab hold of uh, a person engaging in these behaviors and define them as perverse or define them as as um, as um, 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 uh, you know psychologically troubled uh, criminal um, you know deeply immoral and so on and so and so the idea is is that a category of identity and a category of of subjectivity as personal as sexuality is actually generated by, produced by uh, these structures of power knowledge. Okay, and so uh, the sexuality of the uh, subjects in a society are not naturally existing within them. They're not. Again, people don't sort of naturally release their sexuality into the world. Instead, sexuality is a category of social life that is structured and uh, confined and constrained and channeled and disciplined and even produced by these um, um, uh, power knowledge structures uh, that define it, that contain it, that regulate it, and so on. Okay, so so this is sort of so this is uh, 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 Foucault's work, and that this is something then that Butler is going to grab hold of and and use with with great power here. So instead of writing about sexuality, she is going to write about the sexual body uh, or the body as sexed, as sexed into uh, a male and female, and then gender as uh, which we already know of and think of as a cultural construct, but the way that it too is produced by these uh, these structures of power, these matrices of power. Okay, so she's following Foucault here. So this is this is uh, 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 a powerful path. So so here we are. So this is sort of uh, again a really really rough and ugly schema of Butler's book. Um, so power is not repressive only, but it actually generates or produces the bodies, the pleasures, the language structures, uh, and so on. It actually brings them into being and then regulates and produces them. So gender as such or sexual difference as such results from uh, legal categories, legal thought, uh, philosophers and philosophical thinkers, uh, sociologists, uh, um, you know, gender theorists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, pol political thinkers, medical science, uh, religious leaders, um, possibly even economic leaders and so on, you know, that all of these categories of, 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 of knowledge producing epistemic uh, um, systems, that all of these systems uh, are defining and uh, uh, generating power structures that help, um, you know, that define and maintain and reproduce a binary gender, uh, normative or compulsory uh, heterosexuality uh, and so on, right? So again, this thing that, that to naive observers would seem to be a natural expression of some innate quality or some innate cap capacity um, is instead seen here and argued here to be a resultant, to be an effect produced by structures of domination and power. Okay, so very, very uh, powerful framing here. Okay, so chapter one then begins uh, its subjects of sex, gender, and desire. And she begins by talking about uh, sort of the project of, of sort of academic feminism and political feminism and how the problematic of representation um, is necessary or has been necessary to, rep uh, to, to feminist politics 
and that this has presented a kind of challenge for uh, for feminist theorists um, because representation in politics and representation within feminist discourse aren't always aligned. And like Foucault, who worries that juridical systems of power produce the subjects and the subjectivities um, that, excuse me, the subjects that they subsequently come to represent, that they come to, uh, to, to regulate. Uh, the worry here is that in an effort to generate emancipatory movements of of, of, uh, of feminism, right, within the realm of politics, is that there's going to be a project of, of feminist theorizing and, and, and identity construction within uh, feminism that's going to be constraining and confining. And ultimately, the worry is that the subjects who are regulated by the structure, um, uh, that are regulated by the structure, wind up, um, um, are formed by it, are defined by it, are reproduced by it, so there's that dual function of power from Foucault, right? That power structures are both juridical, they're legal structures, but they're also productive of subjectivities and of, 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 um, of, of identities. So Butler on page four uh, is concerned that women, the subject of feminism, uh, is produced and, and, re and, and, um, uh, and restrained by the very structures of power through which emancipation is sought. So in attempting to engage in in politics, representative politics in the West, the need to do that subjects women and, and feminism uh, to these definitional issues and of, of trying to find the essence of woman um, and so on, trying to find the in and the out, right? Where are the, what are the boundary conditions to be defined as woman? So uh, Butler is wary of non-historics and non-historical um, 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 pre-social ontologies of persons, um, uh, notions of, of, of essentialist, um, foundationalist uh, definitions of, of women or of other subject, of other persons, pre-social ontologies, right, that, um, that then constrain or then are taken as a legitimation for a particular, uh, again, political or uh, or juridical or uh, regulatory um, um, uh, structure of the category of, of women. So wary then of mythical narratives of legitimation. We're going to come back to that in part two. Uh, the mythical uh, narrative of legitimation of gender. She's going to go back again and look at like Levi Strauss, Freud, um, 19th century anthropology as it's sort of carried forward into the 20th century by Levi Strauss' structuralism, where gender winds up being an absolute uh, core category, more than a core category, sort of a foundational element, part of the warp and weft of a social structure, right? And that these narratives, these 20th century narratives about patriarchy and, and gender being essential to the structure of society. She's going to reanalyze to generate um, a different reading that, uh, that again, can identify complexity and openings for, um, um, for change. Okay, so uh, page four, uh, women. Um, again, the, the problematic of the political representation of, uh, of women is that you're searching for a unified, universal, common identity. Problematic given what we now know about intersectionality, right, that race, class, uh, sexuality, region, or location, that all of these different sort of dimensions generate a matrix of domination, and that each of these nodes um, operate differently, so that uh, gender, uh, being a woman, is very different depending upon your race, depending upon your social class, depending upon whether you're located in the West or the non-West, rural, urban, and so on. And so it's very difficult then to generate uh, a universal concept of women uh, that would be inclusive enough and, and powerful enough and not regulatory and constraining and uh, um, um, uh, oppressive uh, for women. So, so her argument is, is, that, is that really instead of trying to think of all women as being instant instantiations or um, or representations or, or examples of a universal category of women. Um, instead, um, singular women, individual women, uh, are part of a particularistic structure, um, again, that includes categories of race, that includes categories of class, that includes categories of, of location within, you know, the larger uh, global capitalist system. Again, you know, uh, 
fully modern, fully developed versus more traditional or more uh, uh, more developing, right? That all of these different different dimensions then generate a particularity of experience and of identity and for subjectivity uh, for women. And so, um, and so that this is the task then, to recognize that particularity matters and that, um, at this interme- that these intermediate structures of determination are worthy of understanding, worthy of comprehending, worthy of theorizing. And because, again, women assume very different form uh, in different moments of history because of the structure of particularity in different locations uh, due to the structure of particularity. Um, I am giving myself the instruction here to look at, um, let's get this out, to read uh, page six, uh, which has a summary of Butler's project. I probably won't read it in full, but um, again, her, she's trying to, again, to the presumed universality and unity of the subject of feminism is effectively undermined by the... Um, constraints of the representational discourse in which it functions, the premature insistence on a stable subject of feminism, this kind of universal, seamless category of women, right, that's true everywhere and always, that this attempt to, to insist on that generates domains of exclusion, and then gen- and then it reveals, as she says, the coercive and uh, regulatory consequences of, of you know, politics as a system of power. So even though you're attempting to engage in politics for emancipatory purposes, by engaging with that structure of power, the linguistic structure, the legalistic structure, the law-like uh, structure of politics, you're actually generating coercive and regulatory uh, uh, identities that wind up excluding and, and constraining um, um, women. So so again, she's, she's really engaged then in... Um, identifying the historical present that we're in, uh, like Mark, she says, trying to identify the historical present um, and come to comprehend um, sort of the moment that we're in, the opportunity at this juncture of cultural politics, uh, this period of uh, it, that, that has generated uh, an opening then uh, to intervene in the um, regulation and, reg- and, and regulatory regime of, uh, of feminism, right? So page seven, again, the juridical structures of power, language and politics are the law. Again, language and law, language and law, she's right on the Straussian or the Freudian, uh, again, warp and weft of social structure, language and law, and we're going to find by the time we get to the next chapter, that gender, patriarchy are absolutely embedded in both of those things. That the originary uh, uh, key words of, of, of social structure to Levi Strauss and to Freud and others um, was gendered and as was the law, right? That the incest taboo was the originary law, which is always embedded uh, within concepts of, of, of gender. Okay. So again, the goal is to comprehend the structure particularity that defines and produces gender uh, and women, to identify the, uh, and to define the historical present that we're in, to locate opportunities to rethink the ontology of identity and subjectivity, and to generate new forms of feminist politics. So uh, a big project here, and again, one that, again, like Marx, sort of grabs, uses sort of... Um, not uses, but illustrates for us the link between good social theory and and good uh, politics in a democratic uh, uh, society. Okay. All right. Um, Again, so she's trying to trace the production of the juridical subject of feminism by engaging in a feminist genealogy of the category of women. Uh, so again, like like Foucault was engaged in a genealogy of the categories of sexuality, and she's uh, looking at the categories of women to comprehend how structures of domination and exclusion are sustained uh, in, in in at least contemporary and uncritical uh, representational politics. So again, trying to intervene in the structure and to um, again develop a more progressive, more uh, potent uh, uh, way of engaging in the political system. Okay, so section two, the compulsory order of sex, gender, and desire. Here she's criticizing sex and uh, as, a, as a natural category. So the 
typical distinction between sex as sort of biological or pre-given, pre-social, and gender that is social or cultural, um, that that distinction is something that she, um, I, I think, very powerfully argues is, is inadequate, that sex is always already constructed uh, by linguistic and legal structures. Sex is not natural, therefore um, it is not amatonic, anatomical, it's not chromosomal, chromosomal, it's not hormonal, it's a, it's a cultural construct. So uh, she uses Levi Strauss's Raw and the Cook later in the book, uh, where, you know, that, that, that this is one of the great sort of uh, structural uh, features, that, that, that culture is essentially uh, differentiates. So food is something that is raw that's presented to us in nature, and culture cooks it in varieties of ways, boiling, frying, um, um, and what have you. And, and that, that um, the argument is that food, that there is no raw, Right, that sex is not raw. Sex is not natural. Sex is not like you know food that you find on on the ground or something. It is something that is always already cooked, as she says. Right. So there is no natural or pre-discursive sex. It's always already cultural. So both sex and um, and gender then are uh, are are cultural. Okay. So section two then deals with the circular ruins of contemporary debate. So. She identifies an impasse in, um, in um, sort of leading writers in the philosophy of women. Uh, <coughs> she looks at de Beauvoir's second sex. Um, and de Beauvoir writes that one is not born a woman, but rather becomes one. So again, all of this argumentation is going to be about the way that sex and gender, the, the, the sexual body, the sexual being, and gender as a cultural construct are things that result from social structure rather than emerge naturally, right? And then are shaped by uh, by social structures. So de Beauvoir writing, you know, early 20th century, um, um, again, that, that, that uh, you're not born a woman, you become a woman. The body is a situation. It's not a pre-given. It's a situation. Um, so sex is not pre-discursive, it's not anatomical, but it's a product, it's a construct of society in a particular social structure. So what does it mean for gender and women or any social or moral object to be socially constructed, uh, to be located as, as, as something that is ontologically social, that's, that's, that its very nature is social as opposed to being you know, biological? This is page 11 and 12. So uh, Butler here has a very good uh, framing of this question. So um, there's basically two answers. Once you acknowledge that social objects or moral objects are not natural but result from uh, social processes and social structures, then you have another question to answer. E are those objects malleable or changeable or, or not? And in other words, is the structure monolithic? Is it is it obdurate? Is it deterministic? Is it seamless, gapless, all-powerful? So it's, it's deterministic and it, and it eliminates choice. So the structure is so strong that it eliminates choice and agency and freedom. Or is the structure open enough, uh, complex enough, uh, uh, weak enough at points at least, that that agency is still possible, that people can exercise freedom and choice. And even though that freedom and choice is going to be constrained by the structures of power, there's still openings for, uh, for something like political or personal uh, engagement. So, uh, so it kind of sets up a false dichotomy here that was all the rage when I was first in, in, in uh, sociology, the, the, the structure agency debate, whether, again, structures are all powerful, eliminating free will, free power, that the humanistic subject is simply a mirage, or um, are we able to act as free subjects against these apparently strong structures of domination? In other words, is structuralism or a strong insistence upon structures of domination merely an ideology that keeps us passive and keeps us from, uh, from struggling? Okay, so um, uh, Butler then argues that gender is deeply structured, uh, constraining, um, following both uh, Bo Beauvoir's uh, second sex. The idea is that men are universal uh, subjects, right? They're the universal subjects of, of history, of thought, of, of, of rationality, of reason, of philosophy. Only women are marked 
by gender going to be the term from uh, Wittig that she's going to use throughout here, the mark of gender, right? So only women have the mark. Men are the universal subject that in essence either lack gender or, or are the only gender, depending upon uh, the reading here, um, and that and that women then are separated off uh, with that mark. So they're, they're, they're always a qualified subject, right? subject light as opposed to uh, a full sort of universal subject which is preserved for men uh irigaris uh women woman women are uh is the sex which is not one women are unrepresentable within masculinist phallo phallogocentric uh language this is sort of following irigari follows sort of the lacanian arguments about about sexual difference and the idea that that women are essentially um um represented by uh really can't be located directly within the symbolic order that the symbolic order of language and law um largely is is masculine and and, and that women are outside of that system more as we get to the uh, to part two largely follows uh, lacan here so there's a discussion of how humanist metaphysics of substance the idea that there are essential or foundational um um natural um um traits that are um yeah, that are uh, that generate the universal capacity for re for reason, for moral deliberation, for language. That there are pre-gendered persons that have a kind of a, again a kind of metaphysical substance about them, uh, uh, an essential foundational quality. Um, that the universal person or subject is is pre-gendered, and that uh, and that this is different from a structuralist or post-structuralist view of gender as the result of. Uh, of constraining um, uh, social structure. So Irigare's uh, essentially Lacanian position then is that women are absent. Um, um, that they uh, that they're that they're uh, that, that they don't just represent a lack in the symbolic order, but that they are essentially excluded from the symbolic order. Um, women are unrepresentable not a subject of language, not really even a subject of the unconscious in the Lacanian sense. They are, as Irigari says, the subject that is not one, the subject that is not one. Um, so men can be subjects of language in the unconscious, but, but not women. Uh, women are the subject that is not one. Okay, so fundamental... Um, um, uh, yes, yeah, so then there's a uh, fundamental impasse then regarding uh, Beauvoir and Irigare regarding uh, the meaning of gender. Is, is uh, gender, uh, especially women, represented as a lack uh, which against which masculinity is defined? Is femininity a lack against which masculinity is defined, which is the Beauvoir's position? Or are women radically absent from language, from the symbolic system altogether, um, barred from subject positions as such? And um, so, again, to Butler, this impasse, this divide, means that there is a lot of philosophical and theoretical work to be done uh, regarding uh, the meaning of gender and sex. So, so, that, so far, really, primarily been talking about gender. Now, sex. Um, uh, Beauvoir uh, follows a kind of mind-body dualism, uh, uh, yeah, such that the masculine is affiliated with the mind, is affiliated with freedom, a kind of de disembodied uh, subjectivity. That's the masculine. That men leave the body, men become subjects of reason, subjects of argument, subjects of thought, and so on. It's a disembodied sort of or, or non-bodied uh, subjectivity. And that that's the realm of freedom. While fe the feminine is the realm of the body, women are defined much more by their body, um, and um, that this is the realm of unfreedom. And so there's a kind of Hegelian master-slave dialectic that's worked out here, um, which Butler has written about. Um, so Butler then rereads uh, Beauvoir as a po in, to locate a kind of positive connotation to the equation of women and body or feminine in the body. And the argument is that there's something sort of uh, disembodied and weak or incomplete about male subjectivity if it depends upon um, uh, an escape from the body. So there's sort of like this hope that the that feminine subjectivity may actually wind up being, um, because of its embodied nature, be a liberatory uh, subjectivity in, um, you know, whatever we're in, postmodern, uh, post-structural, post-capitalism. Uh, 
Okay, Irigari views the female body really as marked off from masculinist discourse, uh, canceled and not preserved. It's a much more sort of totalizing view of women as being entirely outside of the symbolic order and the body of women as being largely outside, even unrepresentable within um, the, the linguistic structure of society. All right, so then um, the next chapter then... Um, Butler raises questions of binary constructions of gender and suggests that the particularity of gender as an effect produced by multiple discourses, multiple juridical structures, that, this, that, that that complexity constitutes a field of power, a matrix of power, again, very similar to Foucault's uh, uh, arguments about sexuality. Uh, on page 19, I won't read it, but she describes the particular particularity of women and and uh, of gender that this is not something that's universal that can be defined once and for all for all women at all times that there's a historical process a historicization of these particular structures and then that there are different locations um and in different historical moments and different structural positions uh throughout global capital uh where the particularity of women is is going to be different okay so again this kind of abandoning um, the essentialist um, of, uh, of representational politics. Okay. All right, this leads then to a discussion of the dialogic um, under... Uh, yeah, so instead of... Put, yeah, I gotta see here. Where are we at here? I hope we got this right. Yeah, so then this is here is where she talks about coalitional politics and um, pursuing a dialogic understanding uh, of... That, that instead of generating a unified, essential woman, a kind of, again, a kind of bounded category that all women have to fall within, right? A unitary notion of representation of women is to generate um, a dialogic coalition where different women who are located differentially within this complex matrix of power um, can articulate their own political project, their own political uh, positioning, and then Politics then becomes a project of dialogue between them, right? So it's a dialogic understanding of the differences of these emergent, uh, particularized women um, that are differently placed in the matrix of power, the field of power, uh, women of different races, different classes, different sexualities, different uh, locations, again, within modern and non-modern. Uh, different ages, right? Uh, that are def so that the category of women will always remain to Butler definitionally incomplete and contingent, we, uh, and then that politics of, of of feminist politics then is always going to be about identifying and generating open assemblies, assemblages, open coalitions. So again, she has a really good theory of coalition politics and the way that 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 it's done not by f defining a kind of uh, you know the boundary of if, if you're in or out but much more about defining a kind of core identity or a core set of concerns and then finding dialogic relations and interrelations between them okay page 24 and 25 she uh, goes on to Monique Whitting's writings on sex as an effective uh, discursive uh, uh, power um, um, uh, practices um, she writes about compulsory heterosexuality and the category of sex would disappear or dissipate through a disruption or a displacement of heterosexual hegemony, right? Page 25. Um, there's a discussion of grammatical gender that skips on to page 29. Uh, you know, the gendered language that, you know, much all, all of the romance languages and um, even many of the Germanic languages, uh, with, with sort of the exception of English, um, gender is a core category of speech right you you cannot be a subject of speech without gendering not just people but objects right and so so grammatical grammar or excuse me grammatical gender um you know that language produces compulsory binary gender and heterosexuality as a result so lesbianism then is a, is, is, a, is a disruption or has the potential to be a disruptive agent um that helps to dispel the illusion of, of binary sex, gender, identities, and to um, uh, generate something like a non phallocentric erotic economy. So page 27, the disrupting um, and dissipating of sex would be liberating uh, for women because uh, women um, would then be free to assume the position as the universal subject, right? The full subject uh, in possession of sort of the enlightenment and the... Um, 
of humanism, uh, you know, of uh, the universal subject of history, right? All right, and and that, in other words, stop. If you if you disrupt sex or dissipate the concept of sex, that little asterisk or that little qualification of the subject would go away, and then women would just simply again be be gen would be interchangeable as as um, universal subjects of of history. Okay, so um, grammatical gender then in France, the mark of gender is applied to persons, qualifying them. Again, you're a qualified uh, a subject, you're a woman, as well as uh, most objects, right? So then that generates a kind of conceptual. Um, um, yeah, um, episteme of, of binary gender. All right, so the identity of women then, um, the meaning of sex, the meaning of gender, the meaning of desire, all these things, um, again, are, uh, um, yeah, are embedded within, are often embedded within a metaphysics of substance, formal, um, foundational, essentialism must be, I'm sorry, must be abandoned, um, and we must recognize that these categories are structurally determined and in an oppressive way. And then if we intervene within them, uh, you know, you can loosen the structure and actually generate something like a progressive uh, possibility for the future. So sex and gender and desire are determined contingently within a structure of particularity and that new possibilities can be opened up um, beyond um, uh the normal configuration or sort of what has be, been been historically or within the structure of the West, the normal configuration of the female body, feminine gender, and heterosexual desire, right? That there's other configurations and that become other nodes become possible. Summaries, summary of this is on page uh, 34. Gender is particularity produced and, and compelled, um, yeah, by regulatory practices of, of, uh, of gender coherence. So that's what gender and sex is it's it's produced compelled by these regulatory structures these practices of gender coherence right okay so back to language power and the strategies of displacement so uh Wittig has a, a very similar position to butler's on page 34 performative construction of gender within the material uh practices of culture right that that's what gender is so it's both um it's always performed it's not natural but it is constrained by the material practices of culture so uh so culture in some way produces the appearance of of, of natural gender um, and it's a, this, which is the system of compulsory heterosexuality, right? So this is something that, that, that Butler keeps coming back to, that, it, that an effective system of, of discursive power generates a kind of, of uh, legitimating narrative or legitimating discourse about its necessity, such that uh, uh, natural gender, essentialist gender arguments depend upon a kind of uh, cultural framing of the necessity for this because it's uh, it's 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 embedded within culture. It's, excuse me, embedded within nature. Um, so so there's an argument in culture that's often suppressed that produces the effect or the appearance of of natural gender or natural sex. Okay, um, Wittig reverses uh, Freudian uh, um, arguments about the development of infant. In childhood sexuality, that the maturation of the adult in Freud, one moves from polymorphous perversity, he calls it, which is simply a term for polymorphousness of sexual desire, or essentially uh, a kind of, um, there's a kind of openness to infantile uh, um, uh, pleasures, that the body is pleasured in, in all kinds of ways, um, uh, um, skin surfaces, orifices, and so on. It's very, very multi-sided. And, and that maturation then fixes um, that, there, that there are processes that constrain or that compel the subject to you know, locate uh, pleasure for a certain period of time in the oral realm, in the anal realm, in the urethral realm, uh, depending upon the author, in the genital realm, right? And so that there's a kind of narrowing or channeling of the physics, uh, the physicality of desire, right? And, and so polymorphous perversity is seen as a kind of immature uh, sexuality in Freud. And that, um, uh, and, and that Wittig would like to see this undone so that normative genital heterosexuality would not be seen as a kind of culmination of a good mature uh, uh, subject, but instead uh, would reinstate polymorphousness as a kind of um, telos, as a goal, as an end of uh, interventions in the uh, sex and gender 
uh, uh, system. So on page 37 and 38, uh, Butler invokes Lacan and Freud's pro the argument that prohibition uh, produces the desire for the forbidden object. And I have here, um, see St. Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. And um, so Lacan uh, makes a great deal of this passage in, in, um, in Paul. And, um, you know, Zizek makes a great deal of this. In fact, there's like there's this entire sort of, I don't know, Paul has had a kind of uh, bizarre resurgence in political philosophy and social thought right now. It's bizarre. But at any rate, um, what Paul writes is that, is that, in essence, just like um, Lacan and just like um, um, uh, Butler is doing here, is that sin is essentially something that results from the law, that desires result from prohibition, right? So this is this is Freud's great Great, great, I mean, this is one of Freud's greatest arguments. That, that his argument is is that is that pro, prohibiting something often generates the desire for the thing that you prohibit. Um, that there is a kind of uh, um, aura or fascination that's attached to something that's that's uh, that's barred, right? So the unattainable object of desire often fascinates us because it's prohibited, right? Okay, so this is, uh, again, chapter 7, verse 7, St. Paul, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Uh, nay, had I, I had not known sin but for the law, for I had not known just um, lust. I had not known lust, except uh, the law had said, thou shalt not covet, right? So that sin wouldn't have been present without the law. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concup concup that's a word I don't say very often. Concupiscence, I suppose. I don't know, it's odd. I don't ever say that one. For without the law, sin was dead, right? So the law generates all kinds of desire, all kinds of embodied desires in me, right? It it, it the law turns me on for the thing that's barred, right? So you actually are generating and channeling desire by law. So this is going to be the idea that's picked up here. That uh, that that law doesn't constrain already existing uh, desires, but instead, especially in Lacan, the law produces by prohibiting, produces desire for the thing that's prohibited. That's the subject of the law. The person who must be controlled because they desire the thing that's prohibited is produced by the law itself. Okay, and so there it is. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. So I only sinned because I was forbidden from it by the law. And before the law was there, I didn't know to sin, right? I wasn't sinning. Okay. Okay. So uh, so there it is. So so that basic idea that um, that the the legal intervention, the prohibition within a system generates um, the um, desire and the subjectivity that the system then regulates is is again it's one of it's 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 a pauline notion uh that's very much a part of both uh lacan and and foucault okay so page 39 then butler writes is there a, a, a retrievable sexuality before the law this is true all right so if this is true if 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 if, if it's true as foucault and and saint paul say that you wouldn't have desire right until the law was in place until you prohibit it and if you broaden that out, then sexuality, as such, as Foucault says, wouldn't exist until these uh, these these legalistic, juridical, linguistic structures create the boundaries that generate sexuality. Right? Good and bad, in and out, perverse and normal, uh, legal and illegal, uh, sinful and not sinful. Um, developmentally good, developmentally bad, right? That these different categories then channel and shape uh, the way that the law progresses. So is there a retrievable sexuality that's before the law? So can we recover what sexuality was like before the law was there? Can we recover what it was like outside the law in the unconscious, right? Because that's the sort of argument that the things that are barred go unconscious. So, so can we recover that? and then be subversive by doing the things that are unconscious or can we retrieve sexuality after the law 
as part of post-genital sexuality, right? So this is uh, subversive sexuality then, not perversive uh, or perverse sexuality, but subversive or subverse sexuality. And you challenge, disrupt uh, the compulsory system of gender, the compulsory system of sex, the compulsory uh, heteronormativity. You disrupt it uh, um, by, uh, again, trying to recover an outside, a before, or an after uh, the law, trying to find uh, what desire was before those things existed, what gender would have been before those things existed. Okay, so subversive sexuality, then page 43, are sites of intervention uh, where, where, where the law itself or where the, these discursive and juridical practices can be exposed, displaced, um, and then uh, and we can see how gender was reified, was made to seem real, was made to seem natural, was made to seem unchangeable, and then it can be changed, okay? So page 44, the matrix of power then produces sex, gender, desire, even persons, right, the humanistic uh, 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 person as the universal subject, but the matrix is complex, incomplete, contradictory, and has a history, right, that generates openings for subversive uh, activity. Here's subversive sexuality. So the very multiplicity, this is, uh, uh, Butler writes this on page 44, the very multiplicity of the construction of gender and sex creates opportunity for disruption and, and um, alteration, right? That you can generate progressive social change. You can generate, uh, you, you don't have to reproduce in a cyclical manner, but you can always reproduce in a manner different from what was. Okay, so page 45, the congelation of social forces like woman, these things that are congealed out of social, uh, uh, right? This is the basic structural position here, that things are not innate and natural, but they're produced by social structure. They're congealed out of social structure. So the congelations, the products, the results of social structure then, uh, like woman, must constantly recur, right? You've got to keep doing it, right? It, you have to keep reproducing the conditions that generate gender or it's not going to be generated, right? It's not natural. So that means that the social structure has to be quite, kind of constantly lit up or constantly energized or constantly in play um, in order for it must be ongoing to not be undone. And then that generates, again, a theory of social control and social stain. So consistent with structural sociology, she argues that if we comprehend the structures of particularity that generate identity, that structure identity, under which identity functions, gender and sex function, desire functions, you can turn the power of these discursive systems, these juridical systems against itself to help actually generate progressive change. So again, uh, um, the structure is not monolithic. It doesn't preclude agency and change it's going to have change is going to happen anyway that's what history is but if we theorize what that structure is and come into a kind of again a theoretical comprehension of the structure we can comprehend the the capacities for coalition formation across these different nodes and we can engage directly in subversive activity that disrupts uh, the structural system. So again, uh, the rest of the book then completes the argument and explains um, how this would be done. Okay, I'll shut down now, and then part two, we'll talk about structural psychoanalytic social theory and its relationship to uh, the rest of the book. I hope this is helpful.